So one thing that often comes up is that teams and people writing letters will easily ask to a family or an individual, so tell me what you need. What do you need? What is going on for you? They expect that with this simple and direct question, there will be a simple and easy answer. Hey, can you list the three things you need right now? But rarely are the answers direct. Often the cultural norm for the people we are accompanying is to tell a story rather than answer the question directly. Because their culture may be ba relationally based as opposed to the American culture that can be rooted in individualism, uh, they can't silo an answer into just what is going on for themselves individually. They need to tell the entire story with all the players from start to finish in order for the complete answer, for the complete picture to arise out of the context of the story. So, you know, you might hear someone say, what are your top three, what, what do you need right now? And the person starts, launches into a story. Well, my cousin in Honduras told me once that la, 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 la. And the initial reaction of the person accompanying them might be like, what are they talking about and where are they going with this? So we just encourage you with this example, remember the different styles of communication and center their experience. Be willing to listen to the way they choose to answer your question. Two more examples of centering newcomers' cultural norms is, is around family and time. The most important thing that comes up when there is a cultural difference is not what that difference is, but how we choose to respond to it. By centering their cultural norms and letting yours go, we are accompanying them the best way that we possibly can. Let's take the example of the concept of time. So here you can see on the right hand side a picture of a team dropping off a care pick package for Tereso. He had just lost his housing because he had gone many months during COVID without work. He was able to find his own solution by renting an RV for himself and his son in Palo Alto. So the team decided they wanted to drop off a welcome care package that included both, um, that included a carbon monoxide monitor because with this RV, he needs to use a generator and they were concerned about um, just to make sure that he was safe with that. So they wanted to come deliver it along with some other goodies and they wanted to walk him through the instructions of how to use it. So they tried several times to arrange an exact time to drop it off. Hey Tereso, when can we come? Um, but no matter how many ways they asked the question and no matter how many times, Tereso always responded the same way. You can come by my work. I'll be at work all day, Saturday and Sunday come this weekend. And the, can, the team, this, they, this caused a lot of anxiety for the team because their cultural norm was to coordinate according to exact timing and schedules. They, from, from their perspective, it, you can't even go deliver something to someone without knowing what time to go. But from his perspective, there's no need to say an exact day or time because he knows he's gonna be there all day. Time is relative and phrased in general time frames for him, not exact. So even though it was hard for the team to show up without the certainty of when the best time would be that they knew he'd be there, they did their best to be flexible and stop trying to get an exact time out of him. They received his cultural norm and when they showed up at his work at an unannounced time, Sometime over the weekend, he was there as he said he'd be. Another example is on the left. This is Gregorio. This is an example of culturally prioritizing family before oneself. 
before the individual. With the example of Gregorio, he was under high financial pressure to provide for his family at home. He was in this situation, as many newcomers are, um, from the moment he left home. But it got way worse during COVID because he lost his work. They lost their work. It's, and there's no resources for them where they live in the countryside in Guatemala. He had, he had put up his home as collateral to pay for his journey to get here. And even though it was COVID and he tried to explain to the coyotes, who are the people who guided him on his, he paid to guide him on his journey, um, they did not have compassion on the situation and they demanded that he pay um, quite a bit of money to $7,000 in order to cover a portion of his expenses for the trip. Otherwise, they were going to take his house that his family was in. And you can actually see a picture of the house there in the center with his family. So when the coyotes he owed money to from the journey here threatened to destroy his home if he didn't pay, he had to prior he chose to prioritize to spend his earnings, the little earnings that he had to rebuild his home in Guatemala rather than improve his home where he's living here. What he could have done is use the money to pay for a generator for the RV he was living in. But because he chose to save his family home in Guatemala and provide for those he left behind, his living situation here was that his 15-year-old daughter studied by candlelight every night. They had no stove to cook and they had no water. So they used the nearby park bath public restroom as their bathroom. For the team, this was really difficult to understand how he could choose to live in these conditions. But when they were able to center his cultural norms, they came to a new understanding. They understood that his priority is his extended family, including the ones that are not here. They also came to understand the cultural norm that for him, coming from where he was coming in the countryside in Guatemala, he was used to no running water or light. That was completely normal for him. And in fact, living in the RV, he was very content despite not having what many of the people accompanying him would have considered necessities. They were able to accept and honor his priorities. And by centering his cultural norm, they shifted from perceiving him as living in squalor and being afraid that it was violating uh, child protective services necessities um, and seeing him as making confusing decisions to shifting and seeing his strengths, seeing him as a man content with his home and providing for his family the best that he could. Another way of centering the newcomer immigrant experience is to understand how poverty affects decision making. Let me start by telling you a quote that a recent team reflected after a year and a half of extended accompaniment. They said, there were a number of very urgent situations that had to be dealt with. And I think those of the, us who don't live so close to the margin aren't well prepared for that. I'm not sure any training could have, ex could have prepared us. We had to experience it. See, in accompaniment, you have to expect the unexpected will happen in the lives of families you accompany. For example, we've had illness where one of the women we accompany with children got breast cancer. We had another family who the mom literally gave birth in the ambulance without even knowing she was pregnant. Or let's say perhaps the unexpected of a pandemic. See, life is unpredictable for all of us, but throw 
poverty into the mix and crises after crises continue. What this team was getting at is that this lifestyle of crises due to poverty may be very different from yours if you have this, the privilege of stability and order. Poverty impacts why people prioritize what they do or make decisions differently than you might expect them to. The last thing we'd like to highlight is that how poverty affects people's engagement in accompaniment. Sometimes people are surprised to find they're having a hard time connecting with the people they're writing to or accompanying. They feel like the person's not engaged. We want you to remember that poverty influences their time resources, and resources, including their emotional avail availability. They may not be able to engage because of their situation, their social location, but that doesn't mean they don't want to. It's important to be aware of the privileges of time and energy that your social locations afford you to pursue relationship and reflect on the realities of the people you're accompanying social location and how that impacts their ability to engage in relationship. Don't assume that it's because of lack of interest or take it personally. Center their experience, be curious and patient to understand what's going on for them and do your best to appreciate the ways that they're able to engage as they survive and rebuild their lives. 